none. This brings us to the second aspect of human psychology that I tend if, if given some information in a piece of sentences, I will read only those sentences which appear very relevant to me. The other things I might just glance, but my mind ignores that information as not being relevant. Is that correct? It is under these circumstances that we have to understand in the importance of precisely stated information, importance of its quick dissemination, and importance of its assimilation, and its usage, of course, in decision making. Like you took a correct decision not to go to that hall 302, because the mail explicitly said there is no lecture, the lectures will start from 12th and 30. You would have received a similar mail from me much earlier. You remember that? For the CS792, or you did not? I had sent it to all first year MTech, second year MTech, RS. You did or you did not? You did. How did you not act on it? A large number of students are getting into the hall much later than 8.30. That mail was very precise. It said the class will start exactly at 8.30 and all of you were requested to do all your attendance formalities well before time and be seated before 8.30. Did it not say that? It said. Very similar information that you received for HS791. But you acted upon that information of HS791, all of you, uniformly. But the information which was sent to you ahead of that, which all of you had read, all of you did not act upon it. At 8.30 precisely in this hall, as per that clock, there were about 30 or 34 students out of a class of about 120. Okay. So let's analyze why. I am a student. I act upon one piece of information very diligently, but I do not act properly on another piece of information. Can you analyze? Anybody? I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just citing facts and I'm trying to analyze why is this human behavior so? Nobody can analyze this. This is an obvious reason, actually. I can think of two reasons, at least. Nobody can figure this out? Yeah. Correct. So not attending a class is very useful to me, so I record that and act upon it. Attending a class in time is not useful to me, so I ignore it. I am being sarcastic. But let us translate what he is observing in slightly different terms. The first information required you not to act, not to attend a class. That is always much easier thing to do in life. Someone tells you, don't do this. Why? You take nirvana and relax in your hostel. Nothing is required to be. So to act upon that information was absolutely easy. It, in fact, did not require any action on your part. The second one, on the other hand, required you to wake up early, have breakfast in time, rush to the classroom by 8.20, 8.25, crowd the queue to get yourself registered, and sit in your seats by 8.30. Now, this is something most of you have never done in life. So this requires extraordinary preparation of mind and body and action. So wherever information requires concerted action, an action particularly which I am not used to, it is extremely difficult to follow. Please understand that there is no doubt about your intention. If your intention was to bunk the class, you would not be here. You agree? So your intention was to attend the class. 
Your intention was to participate in the activity. But 8.30 in the morning to be precise there, etc., etc., is something which I have not done from my childhood. So how can I suddenly start doing it in 2015? Agreed? Okay. <coughs> Information must result in proper action, including no action information. If it does not result in proper action, then the information is completely useless. So please appreciate what happens. A, I would wait for the entire class to assemble, which is assembled now, but I can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and it is 8.40. 10 minutes out of a one hour session. What is the percentage, quickly? Sixty, somebody is saying sixty point something. Sixteen point. Ah, I forgot. Computer science students, unless you have a computer or calculator, you cannot figure this out. What is ten minutes as a percentage of sixty minutes? Quickly. Ah, five. So you have collectively you would have ensured, had I not started the class, you would have collectively ensured that that much percentage of the total time of the entire class is wasted. It's just wasted. In fact, those few sincere people who come in advance, do all the formalities and be in their seats by 8.30, would feel like idiots if the class does not start at 8.30. But do other people realize that by coming late, they are insulting their colleagues who came in time? Has it ever occurred to you that you are actually insulting those people who come in time? You would never look at it that way. You look at it as an individual activity. It's a free country. I can come in at any time I want. But when you are working on a collective activity, then unless all individuals collectively do precisely what is required to be done, the group suffers. I would humbly suggest that if you are not going to act on that information, a courtesy email should be sent to the teacher that today I will be seven minutes late. You're laughing at it. I'll tell you my experience, so first story that I will recite. In 1994, when the first time I went out in the US, where lots of our students, so I had an appointment with the CEO of a company at 9 a.m. Uh, a student was driving me, and there was a crowd on that 101 highway in the Bay Area. And it was very obvious that we'll be late by seven or eight minutes. So he was constantly looking at his watch, and I said, that's OK. So he said, no, sir. He pulled off. He called that person, apologized, saying, Professor Fatak will be arriving at 9.15. And then we started. We reached there at 9.14. The office of that company was on the fourth floor of a building. In my honor, the CEO was standing down below to receive me. Imagine what would have felt if he had been standing like a joker from 9 o'clock and I reached there at 9.14. This is the value of timely action. We often talk why we are not called a developed society, although we are reasonably rich and we are progressive and we are smart. One of the reasons is we do not believe in acting on information precisely. We do not have a sense of time. Now, how can that be corrected? It's a social problem. It's an all India problem. They call it Indian standard time as a joke. Okay. But can this be perpetuated? Particularly by a group like yours, who are all destined to be leaders in your field, whatever you do. Because you have slogged hard to come to IIT, you will get a good degree, you will do something fantastic. How can you do something fantastic if you have not learned to be careful about your activities with respect to time and with respect to responsibility to your own colleagues in the group? You agree? So do we have to wait till the entire nation adopts precision in its behavior? Or do we, as individuals, say, no, come what may, I don't care what the rest of the world does. 
but I will practice this discipline myself. Can we do that? Because if I want to do something great in life, I need to learn to be precise because that is how all the people who have done great things in life have molded themselves. They have disciplined themselves to work on time. They have disciplined themselves into disseminating information if there is any event which will say, I will be delayed for this activity. They do feel that they are insulting their group colleagues if they don't arrive in time for a particular activity. If you work with this feeling, not that I am just late, so what, but that by my going late, I will at least be disturbing the class if it is going on. And if for some reason the teacher is waiting because large number of students have not turned up, then I am actually insulting those few colleagues who arrived in time. Remember the word insult. Would you like to be insulted like this? So do we have right to insult anybody else? No. This means that you will have to practice to get up early morning on Tuesdays. And don't tell me that you are all nishachar, therefore you sleep very late in life. I myself sleep at 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock. Of course, I have luckily a good wife who kicks me out of the bed in the morning before, if whenever I have lecture. You don't have wives or husbands, but you can, uh, not all of you at least, maybe some research scholars are married. They might have the advantage of a spouse waking them up. But there are alarm clocks, there are friends, there are calls. And please add 15 extra minutes to whatever preparation time you require in the morning. That's called the buffer time. But I would hate to see this class not filled with 100% students by 8.25 on Tuesday morning. And I'm not suggesting this because something extraordinary is going to happen in this class. We are going to discuss simple mechanisms of effective communication. But believe me, those mechanisms are going to be useful to all of us, all of you. And the first mechanism that I'm talking about is information, its dissemination, and resulting action. So the perfect communication, please be in the classroom seated by 8.30. Any ambiguity in that mail? No. Yet you did not act on it, because that requires changing of your normal behavior. The other mail, we said the classes will start on 12th January. You acted upon that information immediately and instantly, because as he pointed out, no action was required. But do you agree that for a professional, actually doing concerted action which requires some trouble on my part is more important in life than not taking any action? So remember this. That was the first thing. All right. Let me come to the next topic. Stories. All of you would have read stories, novels. Anybody who has never read a story or never read a novel? Nobody. I'm happy. Oh, you have never read a story? God bless you. How, how do you survive? <laughs> because stories not only bring interest in life, but many times they leave indelible marks on our mind and our thinking. So you really, I mean, you would have read some story at least. Ah. I'll tell you, you have studied in school? No, 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 you have studied in school, right? Every school book, at least in some standard, will have some story. I now understand why he says he has not read stories. Because those lessons he studied as a study, he did not study them as a story. <laughs> you get the point? So, you have already learned and mastered the art of distinguishing between work and story. <laughs> that is not correct. Stories are intrinsic part of our life. Stories about anecdotes, about instances that happen, are often very instructive. If nothing else, the stories are very entertaining. And they kindle some kind of imagination in our mind, which could be very useful in other dimensions of our activity, kindled imagination. Because that is what, you know, fuels all your creative thinking. So let me digress and tell you a story about engineering challenges that the world faces in 21st century. 
Have you heard of these? National Academy of Engineers, United States, about seven or eight years ago, published 14 grand challenges in engineering. Don't worry if you have not read about it. Don't feel bad. I also had not read about it. Recently, I was a member of a delegation of the Indian National Association of Engineers, and that is where I came to understand these. And then when I read those, I realized what kind of thinking that has gone behind that work for two or three years. This declaration of 14 grand challenges came after the same association had published some 10 extraordinary achievements of the previous century. 10 or 20, I don't remember. It's worthwhile reading. So please go to the site which is National Academy of Engineers in the United States. One of the grand challenges, incidentally, is advanced individual learning or advanced personalized instruction which is all related to education. Today, the education works in a manner which is a hold-all solution, one solution for all. So there will be class from 8.30 to 9.30. Exactly the same material, the same pace will be given to everyone. If I give a lecture in the classroom, later on, if I'm a slow sort of adapter or absorber, I go back to my hostel and I try to think about what this teacher said. Unfortunately, I can't rewind the teacher and read or listen to him or her again. But the technology permits you to do that. That is the first step in permitting individuals to learn at their own pace. But there are major challenges because different people learn differently. So this is one of the grand challenges of engineering which the National Academy of Engineers in the United States has postulated. And we propose to do something about it. The delegation is now working on defining grand challenges in engineering for India, and they will be disseminated. But an important aspect of all those grand challenges, for example, they use, uh, they, they list solar energy, clean water for all, okay, personalized medical health care, etc., etc. And curiously, if you look at any grand challenge, every grand challenge involves multidisciplinary efforts to solve those problems. That is the requirement of the world. In what fashion is the educational system moving? We are moving into silos and ghettos. So you are all computer science students, right? How many of you have studied basic engineering courses in your B.Tech days or B.E. days? Several of you. Okay. How many of you remember the first and second law of thermodynamics? Very few. Because you would have been studying computer science or IT. And your mind would have rejected all inputs which are not related to Java programming or compilers or something, something. Agreed? This happens because we have been led to believe that our job is to specialize only in one area, which is correct. The human knowledge is growing so rapidly that growth of the body of knowledge in any one field is astronomical. And just to deal with it, you have to create these disciplines. At one time, there were no engineering disciplines. There was just one engineering, which was incidentally mechanical engineering, which is called the mother of all engineering. Just as at one time, there was science. There was no physics, chemistry, etc. Before that, there were philosophers. They were called philosophers because they dabbled in science, they dabbled in maths, they dabbled in some engineering or whatever. But these nomenclatures came later. Unfortunately, we have become slaves of these nomenclatures. We have actually closed our minds to inputs from all other disciplines without realizing that we do require inputs, we do require knowledge, we do require awareness of multiple fields in order to solve a problem. So Professor Richard Miller actually gave a very interesting description of how the education ought to be and how it is. So I'll draw you those three circles, They're very interesting circles. The first circle, he says, is engineering and science. Engineering and science permits you 
to actually work out a solution to a problem in all its technical details. Whether it is possible to construct a solution to solve a problem or not, technically. So it defines what we may call feasibility. Is it feasible to solve a problem? So that is what technology does. There is another dimension Commerce and finance. So mobile technology solves the problem of communication, but the mobile technology will not get adopted by the society at large unless there is an economical system behind it. So unless those devices are mass produced at affordable prices, unless the wireless network is implemented, again requiring finance, and nobody can finance, it's not a dharamshala that the world runs. So anybody who puts a finance would require a profit, so an ecosystem is required. And that is why finance and commerce is absolutely mandatory for any solution to become viable in the society. So commerce and finance tells us about the viability. You would agree that without ensuring viability of a solution, the greatest of technical research is useless because it will never see the light of the day, it will never go to people. And then there is a third dimension. The third dimension is that of humanities, and arts. What does this dimension add? This dimension tells you about what is desirable to be done in life by human being. This dimension tells you to regard a story as a story and not as a study material. This dimension tells you to enjoy a poem and to learn the, the mental state of the poet what the poet is trying to describe. This tells you about your concerns, which are natural about fellow human being, as to how exactly, why exactly you ought to do something for all those people. Humanities and arts, therefore, is a dimension of study, of understanding, which tells me the desirability of doing any action. Nuclear energy can reflect itself in terms of bombs which were dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Nuclear energy also reflects itself into affordable energy for a large number of people. Every technology practically is a double-edged sword. It depends upon what we wish to do and what we actually do. And what is desirable to be done would not be conveyed to the humanity without the study of humanities and arts and social sciences. You agree with this analysis? This is what Professor Richard Miller presented. I agreed immediately with it. His contention was that today's education is so siloed that the people who study this will generally not be aware of the commerce and finance. People who study this or this will generally not be particularly interested in humanities and arts. But if you want to solve grand challenges, not necessarily those 14 which the American Association has listed, but any grand challenge in your own lives. Something that you want to do fantastically for people, come up with a fantastic solution, which is actually implemented and used by people. Then would you not agree that unless the dimensions of desirability, viability and feasibility are all collectively answered, you will not be as successful as you ought to be. His contention, therefore, is that this intersection is a very small intersection to it. And I would regard our educational system, our teachers, me included, to be responsible for this. So I, 
I started recalling that every year when I teach a course, in any course that I teach on a particular subject, do I spend 5% of the time of the total class in discussing these other issues? On how this subject relates to the larger problems? I don't. Because my job is to cover the syllabus, complete it in appointed hours. Now that is a mistake that is happening across the country and probably across the globe. This is one of the reasons why I said stories are important. So I would urge our friend to look at stories as stories. Actually, you perhaps do, but you are not aware of this yourself. Okay? Because uh, it's impossible for a human being not to enjoy a story. Some chutkula somewhere, something. You would, you would have. Anyway. Now, stories of variety of kinds. Some stories are meant for entertainment and they are pure fiction. But there are anecdotes. There are events that happen in our lives. There are events that happen in somebody else's life. And we, when we read about those events, when we read about those actions, something stirs in our mind. Something stirs in our heart. Ah, that is something that is worth emulating. That is something that is worth doing something about. Don't you agree? Of course, because we are so busy in our siloed environment that after some time we ignore that and get back to not attending a class if the male says don't attend or going late for a class if the male says come at 8 30. Because that is what we resort to. That is our normal way of things. However, it might be useful to recall such instances in our own lives. It's not something that we have done, but something that we have seen other people around us doing. Some events, some anecdotes, some instances, which were instructive to us. Now, lessons learned from such anecdotes, such instances could be very many, and they could affect us differently. A particular characteristic that I would like you to emphatically look at in such anecdotes are characteristics related to ethical behavior. And characteristics related to aspirations. These two are different dimensions of human characteristics. What is aspiration? Everybody knows this word because I understand that several people could have problems with English. Everybody understands what an aspiration is? So tell me, you tell me. Yeah. So aspiration is expectation to achieve something in life, right? Good. Everybody agrees? There could be other shades of definition that you can give, but generally, this is what is meant by aspiration. You, each one of you has aspirations, but you would have seen many other people in your life who have displayed aspirations which are very commendable for the situation in which those people are. Have you seen such instances? Okay, I'll tell you a story about a boy I met about 15 years ago. I was asked to, at that time I had just set up the school of IT, and I was asked to give a lecture in Marathi on information technology. It was called Mahiti Tantradnyan. I myself did not realize that Mahiti Tantradnyan is Marathi translation of information technology. But I prepared, I was told that these are 9th, 10th, 11th standard students, mostly from tribal areas surrounding Thana. The event was in a place called Wada, which is not very far off from here. I went there, I gave the talk, I prepared very well, I think the talk went well. Some very intelligent questions were asked, about 300 students, boys and girls. You could clearly see that they were all from tribal areas. They were not, they were dressed in very, I mean, you could describe them as poor of the poor. But yet they were smart, their eyes were sparkling. And they asked some intelligent questions. At the end of the lecture, when I came out, I was actually geraud by these kids. 
and people wanted to take my autograph. I had never given auto. I felt like a movie star that day, you know, signing autograph, autograph. The one boy was standing there. So I asked him, "You need my autograph?" He says, "No. I want to ask you some questions." Mala, you mala, kai prashna vicharai. I said, "Fine." So I asked him to wait. I said, "I'll answer you." After about three or four minutes, the organizers came in rushing, saying, "Press Fatak, the chief guest was the local MP, is waiting for you for a cup of tea." He has to go, and you also said you have to reach back IIT early. So I sort of apologized, finished that signing, gave that paper, and started walking. And this boy held my hand. He said, "Sir, you promised to answer my questions." So I said, "Sorry, boy, but uh, the chief guest is waiting, and so on." Then he said, "But sir, I have walked ten kilometers to listen to you. I stopped in my track. I looked at him, and I said, 'Why did you walk ten kilometers?'" He says, "Oh." I walk six kilometers every day to my school. Then I asked him. I remembered because I had friends. I have myself studied in fourteen different schools in Madhya Pradesh for different reasons. So I have friends who used to walk like that. But to now, I mean, year two thousand. So I asked him why you don't you have in your village facilities like ST bus, tum tum, something something. And he remarkably said, "Ahit pan parvadat me." The facilities exist, but my family cannot afford. And then proudly said, "But sir, I come first in my class." So I told that organizer to please go and give the cup of tea to the MP. I'm not interested. I'm going to spend some time with this boy. So I asked him, "What does he want to do?" He says, "I want to become an expert in information technology. Tell me what should I study? What should I do? Which standard do you study? Ninth standard." So I said, oh, "Ninth standard, okay. So tenth, eleventh, you are studying science. Yes, do science and maths well." I told him about joint entrance exam. I told him to prepare for the joint entrance exam. I told him to prepare for what you call the competitive examinations. I said you become a good engineer, join computer science or IT, and you will become an expert eventually after spending a few years as a profession. And then, just as a parting thing, I asked him, why do you want to become an expert in IT? I knew the answer. The answer was that the probability of getting An extremely well-paid job is very high if you become an IT profession. So that would have been the answer. That is what I had expected. You know what that boy told me? I'll first tell you in Marathi what he said. Sir, you have a student here, Nandan Nilekani. He has an Infosys name company. You have a student called Nandan Nilekani. You have set up a company like Infosys. I want to set up a company bigger than that in information technology. Do you realize the aspiration? I accidentally met that boy. He has absolutely nothing. Economically, he can't afford to travel comfortably to his place of, of study. Walk six kilometers. <coughs> I don't know what the school is, but I can almost guarantee that teachers would never have heard of information technology. There is one teacher who had announced in the previous evening. It seems that some professor from IIT Bombay is coming and is going to talk in Marathi on information technology. That is why this boy had walked on a Sunday. 10 kilometers to listen but can you believe in that aspiration now this boy stands first in his class there would be first second third fourth i mean the top performers in his class several people he would be division a there would be division b division c there would be 10 standard 8 standard 11 standard how many boys and girls all of you would have done well in your schools do you not remember that there would be several boys and girls in your school your classmates who were equally talented not all of them could get into iit not all of them could get to do what they wanted to do but don't you agree that they would have strong aspirations now come to the aspirations of such people how many villages in this country you know the number my god you don't know how many villages india has city dwellers all of us have become city dwellers Six lakh villages. There is at least one elementary school in every village, or at least several in a panchayat. How many panchayats are there? Do you all understand what a panchayat is? Everybody. Sure. Okay. You tell me what is panchayat. Hmm. 
Sorry? A committee. My God. Who appoints the committee? Ah, elections. Very, uh, he is not very sure, but tentatively he is saying that maybe elections. Yeah. Panchayat is the lowest form of devo democratic government, the lowest unit of democratic government, which works for a block or a group of villages or a group of towns or whatever. And panchayats are, panchayat representatives are elected representatives. Just like you have a chief minister of state or a prime minister of a country, you have the panchayat pramok of that village or that panchayat who takes all activities including financial decisions, etc. So there are one lakh panchayats. 100,000 panchayats. A middle school exists in every panchayat. How many boys and girls who, have, who would have aspirations like that? A large number. And who have no means to satisfy those aspirations. And yet, they have decided to struggle. Now, this story told me that, Patek, if you are getting food to eat twice a day comfortably, you are getting a fat salary, you are living very, very comfortably, should you not do something for a large number of such people who have such extraordinary aspirations and ability and talent to back up those aspirations and do something. He may not set up a company, but don't you agree that he will do something extraordinary? Now, what do we do for the such boys and girls? <coughs> so I simply rededicated myself to the task of education because that's what we can do. It had a very profound impact on me. I'm sure you would have come across similar situations which would have had a profound impact on you, right? But do you remember those instances? Do you remember those incidences? And do you do something about those incidents? That is the question. <coughs> while stories are to be read for entertainment, while stories are to be read for general awareness of what is happening, for enjoying them, and learning something about it, I think some stories are also meant to move us so much as to result in very concrete, concentrated action for decades on our beat. Okay. All of us have known about Mahatma Gandhi, right? How many of us know that Babu Rajendra Prasad, the first president of India, was actually a thriving practitioner of law? He was a very rich lawyer. Very rich lawyer. During the Champaran movement, Mahatma Gandhi went and stayed with Rajendra Prasad for three days. At the end of three days, Rajendra Prasad was a completely different man. How many of you know when Rajendra Prasad died, he had zero property on him, nothing. He donated everything that he had to the Quit India movement, joined Congress, and remained steadfast, committed to life of austerity for the nation. Such is an impact that a person like Mahatma Gandhi could have. We unfortunately do not have Mahatma Gandhi roaming around and agreeing to stay with us for three days to transform us. But do we need Mahatma Gandhi? Can such stories not instill some imagination, some creativity, and some different thinking, and some different commitment in our life? That's the issue about story. In next five minutes, I will, uh, will somebody distribute these pages? Have these been distributed? What happened to the other pages? Okay, distribute one page to everyone. Ah, here, yeah, they're here. They're about 200 or so. There are similar anecdotes that would happen in our lives which will teach us lessons in ethics. Everybody is familiar generally about what ethical behavior is. Ethical behavior is correct, lawful behavior, or is there something more than that? So can anybody describe ethical behavior? Let some girl try to answer this. What would you understand by ethical behavior?
No, no, you are describing what would happen if you don't lead an ethical life. I am asking you to describe what is ethical behavior. How will you characterize ethical and non-ethical behavior? Not very easy. Anybody else who can explain what ethical behavior, how you understand ethical behavior? Not cheating is one. What was the other thing that you mentioned? Uh, using wrong means to achieve something. Achieve something for self. There's only one problem. How do you define wrong? Right and wrong. I mean, for 4,000 years, humanity is struggling to define what is right and what is wrong. Not easy. So first of all, right and wrong is most easily defined in terms of laws of the land. If the law says that it is wrong to barge into somebody else's house, pick up a television set and walk out, that the law calls theft. It is punishable. <coughs> Law says that I can't shoot at a person. That is called killing, murder. I may be hanged. So the law defines what is right, what is wrong. If there is no law of the land as enshrined into Indian Penal Code, for example, there are rules and procedures. For example, <coughs> not cheating. So in an examination, you shall not look into the neighbor's notebook. Is a rule. And if I do look into neighbor's notebook and copy whatever that neighbor has written, and if I get caught, then there is a punishment, grade penalty, this, that. These are rules. So every human society attempts to guard against misbehavior or unethical behavior by making rules, laws, and such things. However, not all ethical behavior can be captured precisely into rules and laws. There is the display of an ethical behavior beyond law and rule. How many of you have come across such instances of human behavior which is beyond law and rule? And which tells you something special about it. So let me share with you two stories only, then we'll close for the day. Uh, by the way, uh, no, I will I'll tell you later as you go out. I have given you a blank page, so I'll ask you what is to be done with that page towards the end. I have n number of stories. In fact, uh, I will, I'll send you a link on the mail. I was interviewed some years ago by the IIT magazine, so I had given an interview and I had quoted a lot of anecdotes there. But I'll tell you two instances. One, both of them relate to the academic life. Both of them have occurred on this campus. One relates to a teacher, one relates to a student. And both are very instructive. The first one happened in mid-70s. A colleague of mine, a very senior colleague, Professor Sina, physics department, he was a warden of Hostel 7. His family had gone home during the summer, and he used to take lunch in Hostel 1. So I could often see him because the computer science engineering department was next to math department, and I used to stay on that side. So we'll often cross. And I would see Professor Sina walking towards Hostel 1 or walking back. Now, I knew that as a warden of Hostel 7, he used to regularly visit that hostel once a day, always. I also knew that Hostel 7 food was considered the best after Hostel 1 in those days. Hostel 1 was hostel of rich people, you know. Hostel 1 was called the postgraduate hostel. There were no other postgraduates in any other hostel, only in Hostel 1. And all postgraduate students 
have been characterized by the fact that government used to give them a lot of money. So they did not depend upon their parents and therefore their mess bill used to be high, they used to enjoy life, the food was good. So I asked Professor Sina uh, jokingly, Ke kya Sina sab ap, apne hostel mein kyo khana khate hostel one mein aate hain? And he gave a very remarkable answer. He says, Patak sahab, main warden hu. Wahan log mujhe khate huye dekh lenge, lekin paise dete huye koi nahi dekhega. Do you realize what he said? He said that people will see me eating food there, but people will not see me paying. It means that students in that hostel might wrongly believe that because he's a warden, he is eating free food in my hostel. He would never do that. But it was important to ensure that people do not get a wrong message. So he changed his behavior. He used to walk to hostel one in addition to going to hostel seven every day to eat his food because in hostel one it was very clear that you have to pay for the food if you don't belong to the hostel if you are not a mess member. Don't you agree that this is an ethical behavior which transcends to some extent the rules and laws. He could have of course eaten in hostel seven, he could have paid as he would have paid but in order to make sure that not only he acts right but he is seen to be acting right. He chose to do this. Don't you agree that this one extra step is actually an important part of ethical behavior? The other story I will tell you about a student about five years ago, I think when I was teaching CS 101, it was a unique experiment which did not succeed. I decided to conduct the class for all 900 students in convocation hall. Said we can have one class, we don't need to spread them into two semesters or whatever. So they Dean said, do the experiment. Luckily, IIT Bombay permits such experiment. So in that large classroom, you know convocation hall, right? So some obvious things happened. I mean, the number of people who, who would sleep, the percentage did not increase in the class. But because there were 900 students, you could identify a set of back benches where people had come only to sleep. The, the CS101 is sleep. Now in that class, after the mid-same examination, the mid-same exam was I think for 45 marks or something. I announced a list of 10 top performers, called it list of honors. So honor list had 10 students, I put their roll number, names and marks. And I asked each one to get up, there's some clapping, toppers. So the list I think was about uh, 44 and half to 42 and half, something like this. And I finished that. At the end of the class, as I was walking off, the person sitting in the first bench said, Sir, my friend will also be there in that list. So I said, why? But he says, uh, in the crib session, he has given his answer book for rechecking. He had solved a problem which was not corrected by them, and he's sure to get two marks. And his score will be some 43 and half. So I said, very good. Ask him to write an email to me, and uh, I will update my honors list. Two days later, I get the following mail from him. His paper was corrected. That mistake was found. The TA brought that paper. Our senior TA had corrected that, awarded two marks, and recorded two marks. So as per our official records, his marks were 43 and a half now, right? The mail that I got was very funny. He said, my friend told me to inform you when I get back my answer book. I got my answer book today. And they have corrected the mistake and they have increased the marks to 43 and a half. However, I was just cross-checking once again my paper and I found out that the original totaling done by TA was wrong. And he had actually awarded two extra marks because of the wrong totaling. So my correct marks are only 41 and a half and not 43 and a half which you may kindly note. How many students you know who would do this? Knowing fully well that the record of the course now indicate 43 and a half, papers have been returned. There's absolutely no compulsion for that student to come back and divulge this information. And worse, that student was most probably playing with his own grade, because two marks could mean a great difference in CS 101 in a 950 strong class. In the next lecture, I actually put up his name 
no, his roll number, did not put up the marks. And I said, this is an additional honors list, and recited this story. And I asked the class, do you agree that this person should be in the honors list? The big yes, sir. Then I asked this boy to stand up. He very sheepishly stood up, very shy person. But when he stood up, the clapping from the entire class was the loudest, louder than the actual toppers. Can you guess why? Because all of us respect ethical behavior when we see it. And this ethical behavior which transcends rules is beyond rules. Don't you agree that this was a great, great instructive instance for the entire class, for me, for everyone? To have the guts to say, I don't care if I don't get marks, but I will not have something for me, which is by wrong means, not because the rest of the world may be able to catch me, but because I believe that I should not do it. Long time ago in a army selection board, one major was telling us that you purchase a railway ticket, not because otherwise the TC will catch you, but because you are traveling and therefore you ought to purchase it. I would like you to recall such instances in life, such anecdotes, which I am sure would have happened, not concerning your own ethical behavior. That, I presume, is absolutely top class. If it is not, you better mend your ways. But I am talking about such instances in life, in the form of a story, and write that story. It could be a very short story. You have to recall from your childhood. But do you agree that if you stretch your mind, you will be able to recall some instances where you have seen some people behaving in a perfectly ethical manner, which was probably not warranted to the extreme manner in which they behave. But because those were the people, at least in that instance of time, they believed in being extraordinarily ethical. And therefore, they left a lesson for us. We agree that there is an advantage in recalling such instance. So this is the task for the day. The one sheet paper that has been given, you are required to write a story. Your top line of the page should contain your roll number and name, so that you are identified. Of course, you don't have to write it now, but you have to write it within the next 24 hours, and submit it in a box, which will be kept here from 9.25 onwards. The class starts at 9.30. How many of you have a lecture from 8.30 to 9.25 tomorrow? Nobody. Oh, sorry, 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 Thursday. Ah, oh, not 24 hours, so it is 48 hours. Good, you get bonus time. <laughs> so, 48 hours, but how many of you have a lecture on Thursday morning, 8.30? One, two, three, four, five. Only five people, six. And where is this lecture? Sorry? Uh, in the, in the, uh, and who is the teacher? Professor Sundar. Okay, so if I request Professor Sundar to leave the class sharp at 9.25, then you will be able to rush in five minutes. But barring these six people, may I expect that every student is in his or her seat well before 9.30. If there is a class in this classroom before that, then of course our life depends upon the previous teacher leaving the class in time. Okay, we will hopefully do that. So remember this, on this page you will write your roll number and name and then you will write a story. It need not be a long story. The story cannot exceed the bounds of this leaf that you have been given. So in the worst case you may have to go on to the other side of the page, but I would prefer if you can restrict it to one page. Of course, because the font size is under our control. I can write very, very small letters and write maybe 3,000 words on a single page. 
for God's sake, don't do that. Write normally as you would write. So this is also an assignment for you, for me to understand how well you can write, how well you can write a story which is not from a textbook or anything. You have described an incident that has happened in your life. And in a concluding two line or three line of that story, you might write what lesson you think that incidents brought to your thinking. Is that a fair assignment? Good. So we'll do that. On the next Thursday lecture, I will discuss the entire course organization and uh, the various topics that we'll discuss in the class. I'm sorry we are almost five minutes late. I apologize. Please leave.